Welcome to Sky Team's People First with Morag Barrett. Welcome to this week's episode of People First. And my guest this week is Dr. Michelle Johnston, who is the author of a brand spanking new book that you must get your hands on. And it's called The Seismic Shift in Leadership. More on why I'm so excited about this in a moment. But Michelle is a management professor, executive coach, and a leadership expert who helps leaders achieve results through meaningful connection. Do you see the theme yet? Relationships, connection, we're connected. Anywho, she received her PhD in communication from Louisiana State University and is a fellow member of the 100 Coaches Group alongside myself. She is the Gaston Chair of Business at Loyola University in New Orleans, where she teaches in the graduate and undergraduate programs in the College of Business. Michelle, welcome to People First. Thank you so much, Morag. I was really looking forward to today. I'm super excited to be able to talk leadership with you. Well, the more that I uncover as I read about the seismic shift and it hits the bookstores, I know February the 22nd, this episode is launching shortly thereafter. But the more I read about the book, the more cl- and the more I talk with you, the more closely aligned I think you and I are in our approach to leadership, the world, etc. Yes. Well, I'm looking forward to exploring it. But let's go back to the basics. I want to go back to your origin story. And when you were a little girl, and your mom, your dad, your teachers are like, Michelle, what do you want to be when you grow up? What did the little girl version of Michelle aspire to be? There were two things. I remember when I was in kindergarten or first grade, um, because we're living in in Maryland, I was a a corporate family. So we moved every two years. So I just remember my ages by where exactly I lived. So we were in Maryland and they gave me for Christmas a chalkboard. And um, the Hmm. basement, I don't, we don't have basements in New Orleans where I live now, but we had this big basement and I invited all the neighborhood children and I was the teacher. And I knew right away, I, and, and anytime we learned a lesson at school, I would run home and ask the, my friends to come in so I could teach them the lesson. So that was very clear early on. And I don't think I was a very good student. I think I was always the teacher. So that was a pretty clear indicator. And then the other thing, which is interesting, is I'm not a good dancer, but I loved dancing. And my parents at that era, it was the seventies, they would hold these parties once a month and the music would be played. It would be the Beatles and uh, the Temptations and the Spinners. I remember, and I would just sit on the stairs, just mesmerized watching them all dance. And the reason I bring that up is because I love the energy when people are all together. And so I think that kind of plays, I, you know, I really enjoy teaching. um, And I also love leading big events. I like giving speeches and just sharing information where people can use it to be the best versions of themselves. I love it. I don't know if you know, but I'm a ballroom dancer or I was before COVID. And only recently, I mean, I've been dancing now for 10 years and my youngest son was my ballroom dancing partner since he he couldn't see past, let's just say. And one of the reasons I did it was um, to be elegant, all right? But as the female in a dancing partner, I have to follow. And in every other aspect of my life, I lead. And so that was part of it. It was learning to follow and not lead, give up control, learning to make small talk with strangers, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and just generally be elegant. And it is, I, I miss it to my core. But for me, I liken it to leadership because organization, teams, individuals, it is all a dance. And it's how do we give those clues that to your yeah. point make us successful together? You are absolutely right. And there's something I was talking to my daughter. She's a senior in high school. And I had just flown back last week from California um, facilitating this big event for Qualcomm. And I was up on stage for eight hours and 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 it was just so energizing, depleting at the end of the day, mm-hmm. but it was energizing. And I was telling her about it. And she said, you mean you were mic'd up on a stage for eight hours speaking to a big group? I said, yes. She goes, that is my nightmare. Mom, I would never want to do that. And I said, that's so interesting because I've always enjoyed that energy of leading people. Mm-hmm. I just love it. And, and when you and, and she and I clearly are very different. She's like, that is absolutely 
my worst nightmare. So there are some people like uh, that's why I brought up, you know, teaching and dancing to kind of combine those those passions of, of energy and interplay and team dynamics with just giving people the information that will help them be even better. And it's interesting because your daughter said, oh, I could never do it. But what she's seeing, again, it's the typical mistake, the tip of the iceberg of you did it for eight hours. None of us start mic'd up for eight full hours in a big auditorium. And no matter what she does as a career, the ability to communicate is going to be a skill, whether it's around a conference room table on the phone or on the big stage. So she's going to have to learn some coping mechanisms. So I have got another question for you because... If there's one thing at the back of my voice that's always or back of my head, the trash talk is well, oh my God, Dr. Michelle Johnson. And it's like, oh my God, you've got your PhD, you're so smart. You teach, you teach uh, the graduate and undergraduate program. So when it comes to leadership and management, I'm assuming you know a thing or two. So I'm curious, what's the leadership lesson you've had to learn the hard way? That's a great question. And, and it is profiled in my book. Um, I took a big risk with this book. Academics typically don't write books like this and they typically don't self-disclose. Mm. And I, I did a lot of self-disclosure that my biggest leadership lesson that I had to learn myself through almost failing in order to be a better executive coach and help other leaders is that for a long time, I thought to be a leader was all about exerting power. Mm -hmm. Using my title, using my credentials, I'd walk into the room and there was a very clear demarcation between me and the students. And I had the power and they didn't. And and I really thought I had been mentored, but it was also, again, the sign of the times. Mm -hmm. I had the command and control and the authoritarian style. I don't think it was ever effective, but it certainly was the norm. And so my mentors in graduate school, and then when I, I was so young, or at least I felt very young, I was 28 years old as a brand new professor at at Loyola in the MBA classroom, finishing my dissertation on the weekends um, from LSU. And so I I would get mentored of how to be so strict and lecture on hours and kick students out if they're late and write on their work, you know, do it again, this is awful. And, And now I hear that and I think, oh my gosh, in my age, with my experience, I would never fall victim to that. But back then, I was pretty impressionable, and I wanted to succeed as a professor, and that was the norm. So I had been working for a consulting firm during my entire 20s. I knew better, Morag. I knew about adult learning theory. I knew about experiential. I knew about the group exercises and role plays, and yet I threw it all out the window to try to be successful as an academic. And I, and I changed, you know, or adapted to that. And guess what? I almost failed. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, my students were like, who are you trying to be? Yeah. And, you know, all powerful and, you know, yeah. I mean, it just, it didn't work for me. I wasn't authentic. I was trying to be somebody I wasn't. And so fast forward years later, when I was coaching three leaders in one year ended up losing their jobs and I went back to try to figure out what was it? How could I be a better coach to have helped them? And all three of them were trying to be somebody that they weren't. They weren't comfortable in their own skin. And that's when I had the eureka that propelled me to write this book. And I think what propelled me is that I not only saw it in my coaching life, but I recognized that that had been me in my personal life, trying to just, you know, lead with power, lead with authority and trying to be somebody you're not. So what I realized with my leaders is that because they weren't authentically themselves, they weren't comfortable in their own skin. They were hiding parts of themselves. I call it, you know, the mask of perfection. And they were trying to be perfect, whatever perfect was. Mm -hmm. And to me, perfection equals disconnection because there's a wall up. And that's, that's what happened to me. So I realized that when, when most people think about connection, which is the theme of the book, they think about connection with others. And that is true. These leaders all lost their jobs because they had lost their connection with their team. They had lost trust. But why? 
And that's when I spent a long time delving back into the data, the data books, the 360 qualitative reports. And the reason why they had lost connection with their team and, and trust with their team is because they weren't connected with themselves. And that to me was the big Eureka. It's the foundation. Your connection with yourself is the foundation. foundation. And then you can be connected meaningfully with your team. And then you can be connected with your organization. I'm having a twilight zone moment because I said earlier on, the more we talk, the more we're aligned. And I think we're twins. We just didn't know it. Because in my first book, Cultivate, I did that self-reveal and being British the thing that I revealed, A, is that revealing stuff is not British. And I was always the stiff upper lip. And to be a successful leader or a coach, I've got to present your words, perfection, but that I've got my stuff under control, whereas behind the scenes, maybe not so much. And I delineated between work and home. And it wasn't until I wrote Cultivate and as I started to relax into it, well, a leader said to me, you know so much about me and I know nothing about you, that I started to let the door open. And here's where I get even more goosebumps is I'm working with Eric and Ruby on my team for our, my third book, but their first, it's the sequel to Cultivate and it will be out later in 2022. And the title, Michelle, just been approved. We haven't got the subtitle, but the main title is You, Me, We. Love it. And it's all about the importance of connection. And you talk here about compassionate connections. And ironically, in the ally mindset model that we're presenting in our book, the second characteristic is connection and compassion. All right. So you're getting goosebumps yet. But I yeah. <laughs> So I'm curious, you call it co- compassionate connections. And you, you've touched on the fact there's more than one. It's not just me. So tell us about the three levels of co- compassionate connections and what this means for you. Yeah. So when I had this Eureka and I felt like it was like a calling, like I had to get this information out there so that other people didn't fail. And, um, and, and so I thought, well, I could just write the book about my observations, but I'm a trained researcher and that wasn't enough for me. So I went and I found 18 executives from around the world and I went to them and I shared my theory and I said, which level of connection, connection with yourself, connection with your team or connection with your organization is your superpower and which one have you struggled with and share stories. So the book has some really rich, vivid stories of connection and disconnection. And what I learned from all of them, because I just came up with those three levels, like you've got to start with connection with yourself, Mm -hmm. connection with team to get to connection with your organization. It's all about values alignment when you're up here. And what I discovered through all my interviews is the way to truly effectively connect with your team after getting comfortable in your own skin is compassion. You have to lead with compassion. So I found that, again, through the interviews, the function of connection with self is authenticity and spending Mm -hmm. a lot of time owning your story, very a la Brene Brown, figuring out what you're ashamed of, what you're hiding, whether the story you're telling yourself needs to be tweaked or updated, whether it's working for you or not. So there's a lot of work that goes into true connection with yourself, but the function, the base of that, the founder is authenticity. And then when you get to that next level of connection with team, after hearing all the stories, I realize you can't truly connect with your team unless you exude, demonstrate compassion. And then to get to that highest level of connection with your organization, it takes total alignment so that there's not cognitive dissonance. Your personal values need to be aligned with the organizational value so that you can be the leader that's walking the talk. And I'll give you a great example of this. One of the leaders that I interviewed, he was such a great interview. His name is Jim Mora, and he just was named the head coach at the University of Connecticut football team. When I interviewed him, he was on ESPN Sports Center. He had just come off of the head coach position at UCLA and before that, Seattle Seahawks, and before that, the Atlanta Falcons. And just a really great guy and and humble. And and he was one of the few leaders who actually told me about failure. And he said when he was the head coach for the Atlanta Falcons, 
he went up to his hometown, Seattle, Washington, and he had gone and he had played football at the University of Washington, the Huskies, and he was on a radio show. So this happened to be a weekend where they weren't playing on a Sunday. They were about to be on Monday night football. So here he is on a Saturday and he's on this radio show and he said, Michelle, we were just cutting up. This was my old college roommate. We were having so much fun. And the last question, he's like, Jim, if the head coaching job at the University of Washington came open, would you take it? And Jim said, at that moment, I completely lost connection with the fact that I was the head coach of the Atlanta Falcons. And I got caught up in my ego and, and the levity of the moment. I was like, that would be my dream job. <gasps> yeah. yeah. Morag, he was fired. He lost his job as head coach of the Atlanta Falcons because when he returned, the owners called. He had to go into the locker room and so many of the team players he had recruited, they followed him to the Falcons. And he said he could feel in the locker room oh. that loss of trust. He said, and then it got even worse because he had to go on national television, Monday night football, and there were effigies of him. He said he had never been... Um, called such names and he ended up losing 30 pounds. It was just horrible, right? But he said, now that's an example. Boy, did I learn my lesson. When you are a leader at an organization, you're representing that organization and you can't forget that. No, I mean, it's, oh my goodness. It's interesting in one of our case studies where we talk about connection and compassion, we did some work in the oil and gas industry, which is like literally life and death. And we kept hearing about this um, almost uh, mythical leader within the group. Uh, and Eric tells this story in the book. But I can't remember the guy's name, Fred. Let's just call him Fred for the time being. But Fred would come up in various uh, sessions as a role model for connection and compassion. And he happened to be walking past one of the workshops and stuck his head in. And Eric was like, oh, my goodness, you're the Fred. Do you have a minute to come in and tell your story? And his story around how he built connection and compassion was around on his days off, because in oil and gas, you're two weeks on and then there may be a week back at home. He would just load his truck up with pizzas and drive to each of the drill sites, which could be hours apart, but he would drive. And then he would just stand and eat pizza and ask about their lives beyond the job they were doing. And... He was not afraid to use the phrase, I love you guys. Oh, wow. And in oil and gas, not a phrase that is used as the opening line. But his point was that if you know I love you, if you know I've got your back, then you're more likely to listen to me, especially when I'm giving warnings of impending disaster. And certainly, as we saw as a result of our program, Safety Leadership, the number of reportable injuries went down dramatically when we focused on the quality of the relationships, aka connections, the seismic shift in leadership that you talk about. So you just love it. <laughs> How about that? That's incredible. That? And you know, I found the same thing that the importance of compassion. I was about to send off my manuscript to the publisher right when mm. the whole world shut down. Isn't that terrifying? Because you're about to get your homework graded and you're the professor. Normally you're grading our people's homework. The publisher is about to grade yours. And I'm about to send this off. And the whole premise is the importance of connection. And the whole world is about to be disconnected. And I and and so those first two weeks of the quarantine, when you, we were all sitting at home and even going outside, we're wearing masks. And I realized I had to push pause and I couldn't publish it because I had to circle back with the leaders to find out how they were connecting in the biggest global era mm -hmm. of connection. And here's what I found, and we're not putting the toothpaste back in the tube, Morag. Now no. that, that these past two years and it's continuing, we are conducting business like this. The leaders who, and I conducted a lot of pulse checks at organizations I was working with, and the leaders who were very authoritarian, you know, super type A results, results. And they just kept using that style when there are, you know, brand new babies, vomiting, dogs, yeah. barking. we are now in our uh, personal lives. And those leaders, there were two of them in particular that ended up getting pushed out because they just couldn't figure out how to demonstrate compassion 
when everyone was suffering so much and they would just gloss over the fact that, oh, oh, this isn't, you know, business as usual. Mm-hmm. And so I started really preaching that if you want to be successful right now during the pandemic, you have to spend time meaningfully connecting with your people on a personal level. And more, I, I can't tell you how many of my leaders that I was coaching, the high level chiefs would say, I'm coaching 15 chiefs right now. And they'd say, Michelle, but I mean, I... I don't know touchy feely stuff. Can't do that. We Mm -hmm. we've got to make money because a lot of them are chiefs of hospitals. They're like we're we're losing money left and right. We can't have elective surgeries. And you're telling me that in my big Zoom team meeting, and I'm supposed to be talking about finance. You want me to embed ten minutes to ask them how they're doing personally? (gasps) Yes, said yes. We are. Yeah, and you wonder why we're seeing headlines about the Great Resignation. Some of that is a tri- directly attributable to the fact that the last time I saw you was as we all evacuated the office in March 2020. And if we haven't spent the time reinventing spon- uh, scheduled spontaneity and the water cooler conversations and how's the cat and how's the book and what are you doing this weekend, then you are not going to be successful as a leader and you are definitely not going to be successful as a business. Amen there. Uh, Amen. That is exactly the, that is the, get the book. Okay. So earlier you talked about three levels, the uh, connection with myself, you, the connection with others, and then the connection with the organization. And you gave us an example. You interviewed the 18 leaders to see which was their superpower, which was kryptonite or needed care and attention. So which for you then of the three, which is your superpower and which is the one that you have to give deliberate thought and attention to. So when I had that big eureka that I had been trying to be somebody I wasn't, I spent a lot of time trying to understand why I had a wall up and why I felt like I couldn't be me. And I honestly didn't think that my natural qualities, which I now see as strengths and superpowers, but back then I didn't, my qualities of being nurturing. I, I, I looked at my students when I walked in like, I want to help you. But yet I was kind of contorting my mind like, I've got to figure out what you're doing wrong. It's a totally different mindset, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm really enthusiastic and I was told to tone it down. I had, you know, I used to love, I mean, I, I do now too, but at the time I, I used to love fashion and I toned that down because I, I, I just didn't think that being a 28 year old feminine, nurturing, highly energetic female was going to succeed in the business school. So I, I then just had to work and work and work. And one of the things I had to work at too is I didn't, you know, when the example that you gave that you gave me was brilliant about as a Brit, you had to have the stiff upper mm-hmm. head. And somebody told you, you know everything about me, but I know nothing about you. I would never, I would never talk about myself. No. I had to figure out why. And I had mentioned earlier I was a corporate brat. And I think it, I was so uncomfortable because I didn't really, I didn't, to me, I didn't have a hometown. I didn't really grow up in one place. People thought that I, my dad was running from the CIA. Why are you moving every 18 months? What, like people couldn't figure me out. And so I didn't know who I was because I was so used to just adapting, adapting, adapting. Yeah. It got me in trouble when I got to Loyola because I was so used to that. I just looked around and said, okay, I'm just going to adapt again. I lost myself. So people didn't know who I was, but I didn't know who I was. So I really had to spend a long time real and, and working on that story that I was telling myself that it wasn't a bad thing that I grew up as a corporate brat. Uh, you know, I, I yeah. don't know why I called a corporate brat, but like a military brat, it wasn't a bad thing. I was, I really became resilient and adaptive, mm-hmm. and adaptive and I loved learning about people's stories and new adventures and cultures. I had to reframe how I was telling myself about my upbringing. It's a classic example of it's not just um, weaknesses that hold us back or gaps. You know, I don't know how to speak French, but it's also overplayed strengths. And so what you had done is looked around at the role models as you entered into academia and said, I've got to model myself on those. Plus, to your point, you were already a chameleon. So the anchor point of who am I? as an individual was buried deep. Mine was buried deep because, again, British, I'm not going to look inward and even explore that. I'm doing better now. But again, I didn't know. So I could deflect and ask questions and you'd share all sorts of things. And I thought that was what was going to make me successful. But I found out if you bring your human to work, 
Yeah. Oh my goodness, there are no heights we can't reach together. Yes, I remember researching, you know, in academia, it's publisher parish. And so I was working with my colleague, Dr. Kendra Reed, and um and we were looking at um, high-performing teams. So what, mm-hmm. what characteristics differentiated high-performing teams from low-performing teams? And I'll just never forget looking at this article that the conclusion found that it was the presence of females on the team made it a high-performing team. And I swear it was that moment I thought, you know what? My teaching evaluations were low. I was coming up for tenure. I didn't think I was going to make it because you have to be, especially at a at, at Loyola, you got to be a really good teacher in the classroom. And and again, they were just below average. The students are like, "Who is this person? And why are, why is she acting like that?" Because they see me in the hallway, and I'd be like bouncy, bubbly. Hey, how you doing? And then in the classroom, I'd be like, blah, blah, blah. Um, In any case, that article, I I, I realized I had to take a risk and I had to give myself permission to be a feminine, nurturing, okay, energetic woman. And it was a huge risk, but it paid off a couple of years later. I got faculty of the year. So in our new book, we have a chapter that is essentially along the lines of my misunderstood genius is somebody else's brilliant jerk. So you talk there, you see, you were a misunderstood genius perhaps labeled a brilliant jerk by your students. So how did you move from a reputation as a lecturer that was a little hard ass and get to the authentic you? What were some of the steps that you took to close that? Yeah, Yeah. well, funny story. One of the the leaders that I interviewed in my book, Robert Leblanc, such a wonderful name by the Bayou, Robert Leblanc. And he was a fifth year senior. So he was probably 22, 23. I think I might have been 28. And he had played on the basketball team, big guy, good looking guy. And he walks into my class and goes in the back row. And I immediately just thought, oh, no, no, no. (laughs) I called him down. I put him in the first row. I mean, I was hard on him, really hard. And he ended up, he's one of the most successful hospitality leaders in New Orleans, which is, you know, a hospitality city. And when I showed up to conduct the interview, because I really thought it would be cool to interview a student. He's the only student that I taught. And he said, again, he's huge. He goes, Dr. Johnston, you still scare me. <laughs> a little bit of fear is always good. Speak on a tone. <laughs> but he got me at that time where I was just yeah. so tough. Um, but yeah, I what what steps did I take? I spent a long time. I I, I started making my students own their story, and then I realized I hadn't owned my story, and I spent a lot of journals, hours writing and writing and writing to make sure that the script I was selling myself was a positive one and that I was mm-hmm. accepting of the warts of, of the struggles that I had in my childhood and, and reframe them forward and say, gosh, but it made me moving around all the time and adapting ended up making me a really strong person. I'm going to own that. But I had to figure out who I was and embrace the fact that a dean said, tone it down. And I lived with that in my head, tone mm-hmm. it down, down, tone it down. Oh my gosh, I can't show my energy in the classroom. But then the number one characteristic in, in the, the question in the teacher evaluations, the faculty evaluations were what's her biggest, biggest strength was enthusiasm and energy. So I, you just have to, once you get enough feedback, you have to incorporate that and feel comfortable enough to, to lean in with your strengths. And that was hard because I didn't think they were my strengths. Okay. Well, I've been reading more and more about your work, research the book, and it's been described. It says fans of Brene Brown, and I'm a big fan girl of Brene Brown and Adam Grant, big fan girl of Adam Grant too. Um, If you like those two authors, then this is an essential read for all leaders. And our friend and mentor, uh, Marshall Goldsmith, described the seismic seismic shift in leadership as critical for all leaders today as we move into a more digital and virtual working environment, which you touched on earlier. So how can listeners or those watching us on YouTube, how can they learn more about you, your work, the book? Etc. Absolutely. Yeah. Michelle K. Johnston.com is my website. 
and it's got a lot of interesting info. But the book is on pre-order by Amazon. And and again, even though I, I shared a lot with you today about my journey and my stories, I think what makes the book a great read is is learning from all of these successful executives like Juan um, Batisto Alonso Martin, who's the global president of Kind Bars. And Mm -hmm. he was in Barcelona when I interviewed him and he told stories of him trying to be perfect for years and thinking that that was effective and it wasn't. And when he finally learned just to put his guard down and be authentic, Mars, the company he was working for, had just bought Kind Bars from Daniel Lubetsky Mm -hmm. and, and went in search of the entire global organization, a leader who exuded compassion and kindness. And he never would have gotten that job if he had been still trying to be somebody he wasn't. So I think that's what makes the book a really good read is just learning from these interesting leaders, what they did and didn't do well. Um, But yeah, you can go to my website and you can order it on Amazon and please post a review. And it's just a super exciting time. It's my first book and uh, I'm just thrilled to get the, the word and the message out there so I can help others. All right. Well, I'll reiterate that. It is a phenomenal read. It is one of the most important topics. I know because I've now written two books about the importance of relationships at work. I strongly recommend it. And please, as Michelle said, a review on Amazon or your favorite bookstore website. We don't mind, but it helps get the word out. So tell us what you think, because that's how we learn and grow. Michelle, thank you for joining me here on People First. Thank you so much, Morag. This was just the highlight. I couldn't wait to talk with you. It was just wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining Morag today. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe so you don't miss a thing. If you learned something worth sharing, share it. Cultivate your relationships today when you don't need anything before you need something. Be sure to follow Sky Team and Morag on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you have any ideas about topics we should tackle, interviews we should do, or if you yourself would like to be on the show, drop us a line at info at skyteam.com. That's S-K-Y-E team.com. Thanks again for joining us today. And remember, business is personal and relationships matter. We are your allies.